I want to introduce a, a friend of mine who's an accomplished chef, and um, we're really lucky to have him here on the speaker series, um, Chef Stephen Maynard. Um, and I will let him explain who he is and his history, but all I can say is uh, let's give him a round of applause and welcome our first in the speaker series. And now I'm going to probably like trip you guys on all the different jobs I'm doing right now. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I'm up to. Um, up until a year-ish ago, I was the food service director for the school district, believe it or not. So I was managing all 56 schools, um, including Fairview, 200 employees. Uh, it was an insane job, trying to feed kids every day and appeal to the parents of Boulder who are not always the gentlest with their criticism. So I left that job in March. I started my own company, but I have two kids. I have a mortgage in Boulder. It's expensive to live here, as you know. So I picked up a bevy of part-time jobs. I just want to kind of tell you a little bit about what I do currently. Um, and I never would have guessed that I'd be doing these jobs, but I'm currently the chef at a frat house. That's where I'm going right after here. On Fraternity Row. It's called Phi Delta Theta. Phi Delta, Phi Delta, Phi Delta Theta. And I kind of lucked out with this because it turns out this is the frat that has like a high GPA and it's a sober frat, meaning you can't bring drugs and alcohol in the house. So it's generally in a lot better condition and repair than some of the other frat houses you might be familiar with. They still play like Pong or whatever, whatever. they still do the same stuff that fraternity people do, but they go elsewhere if they would like to indulge in. So that's that's kind of cool. It's 40 guys. They all live there. It's around the corner of college, 1111 College. Big, cool building. I have a really nice kitchen. Work by myself. Just me all day. Just do everything. Set the menu, do the ordering, do the dishes, mop the floor, everything. Um, so that's my kind of main steady gig. I get health insurance through this. I make steady money, you might say. I'm also a uh, registered dietitian, which is what I wanted to talk about. Uh, does anyone know what a registered dietitian is? Or have you ever met one or talked to one? Anybody? RD, sometimes called RD. You typically run into us in a hospital setting? No? If you have, let me put it this way, if the adolescent age range, typically you would see an RD if you had disordered eating, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, some significant eating disorders, if you were significantly overweight or underweight, you might see a RD in a clinical setting. So that's like among this age bracket. As you get older, you've seen it for other people. Can I ask a question? Is that, a, is that a viable uh, career choice? Totally, no, totally. What does an RD make in a hospital? So in Colorado, I'd say starting in a hospital is maybe 55K. Like starting, but you could come out of college making that much. You could come out of college making 55. But, but this, is, um, this does require a four year nutrition degree and then a one-year unpaid internship in which you cycle through all types of different settings of feeding people at different phases of the life cycle. So the elder care that you mentioned, senior living. So to do the dietetic internship, you have to do a year unpaid, quite a sacrifice, but you spend three to four weeks in a whole person's a senior living center. You spend three or four weeks on a NICU or an ICU unit, like working with young babies and pregnant mothers and people going through those changes of life. You work in a school setting like BVSD or school nutrition. Uh, you, work, you might go college and university. Uh, there's, you basically have to put a touch point in all these different areas. Um, I realized during my internship that I wasn't really cut out for hardcore clinical work. Because when you're in the clinical setting as a dietitian, you can get a job where you're working with like ICU level patients, patients that are like live or die type of stuff, and you're in the same setting as ER doctors and nurses, and it's a very intense environment. I spent three weeks in that environment. I watched a lot of things happen in the hospital, and I was like, I don't think I'm quite cut out for that. That's not quite my thing. But interestingly, I'm glad I got this credential because I'm now actually working as a dietitian at a place down called Centennial Peaks. Does anyone know Centennial Peaks? It's down by a Vista Hospital, Monarch. No. Centennial Peaks is an inpatient psychiatric hospital. So we have students from a range of actually 13 and up, so quite a lot of adolescents. There's an adolescent unit, there's four adult units, and some very, very acute psychiatric conditions. And so what I'm doing is working one-on-one -on -one with patients who want advisement on food and working on how food can improve or engage with your mental health, how it can help recovery, physical recovery. Um, so it's a super interesting job, but again, super intense. Like, I've been doing it for three months and I'm burned out. Like, you think you gotta realize sometimes you have to do a job to feel if you really want to do the job. Does that make sense? There's no other substitute for experience. I think it's so anyway, these are my current, my two jobs. 
totally different. This one's very chill. No stress, like almost no stress. The clientele is very not discriminating as long as I make enough food. Here, I'm getting like emotionally involved with people's lives through eating and through diet, but like the conversations get quite intense. So at this point, I wished I had a degree in counseling or therapy or something else. It's, a lot of times there is a strong connection between food, behavior, diet, and mental health. So, all right, I got a little heavy for a minute. Okay, I'm gonna lighten it up a little bit. Can you, you throw the- Any questions on um, yeah. these two jobs? There's not a lot of people that do both chef and those What are you starting your own business? Uh, I'm figuring it out. It's seven months old. It's called Molto Cure, and I'm trying to do a lot of training and education. I'm training lunch lunch staff at different school districts. Uh, I'm doing a little bit of restaurant menu work, like menu and menu analysis. It's a lot of restaurants now want to have the nutrition information up on the screen, you know, the carbs, the calories. Um, so I'm doing a little bit of that kind of work, but I'm still kind of figuring it out. Thanks for asking. Um, okay. Where am I going next? Oh, next picture. I don't have two images today. One is the octopus on Instagram, and the other is my grandfather. So. Oh. That's too cool. So really wild is, I just got this picture from my dad like a couple days ago. This is my grandfather, Chuck Charles. He was a butcher in South Bend, Indiana. Um, I only knew him for like a few years. He died when I was four-ish. Um, but I thought a lot about this picture in coming here because his job was so different than our jobs or my jobs or the modern day work environment. Like this is, you know, this is in 1960, South Bend, Indiana. Every day all he did was get in there at 5 a.m., cut meat and sell meat to customers. All of his interactions were in person, over the counter, from two or three feet away, or maybe by phone call. Yeah, obviously, obviously he had a phone, so. You think he washed his hands before not to use it? Well, I'm sure that food safety was adhered to in every level, so. But, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, you can tell the guy's working. Right? He's like a manual labor profession, and I think that's what's been a reminder to me. You can never quite get away from the manual labor part of our profession. Like, even at the hospital, I'm, like, breaking down boxes and helping take the trash out. And there's a certain element of manual labor that you just, is inherent with the position, I think. So, anyway, my grandfather, I never knew him well, but he was in the food world, and uh, I liked his hat. I wanted to his hat. It's like, I think it's like a little paper hat. It's about every day. That we don't have to wash it. Anyway, you know, I think family history is important. And nowadays I get so distracted, and so many of us do, by emails and phone calls and texts and your real life applications. And, you know, like it's just such a bewildering world. He focused on really one thing making his customers happy so they come back again. And that was his job every single day. You help the lady down the street and you give her a few extra you know, beef bones for their, her dog or whatever, and then she'll come back. And he had customers who came to the shop for 20 years, 25 years, right? So I think it also made me think, uh, people are very fickle nowadays. They don't necessarily have an allegiance to one particular thing. And with the trends in the food world, people tend to kind of go up and down. Like I was at Shake Shack yesterday with my kids. And they now have this whole Korean menu, right? All Korean spice, barbecue, all this different stuff. Two years ago, I was at a conference and someone said, Korean menu, or Korean tastes are on the rise among young people. Like two years ago at the CIA in California, and then all of a sudden I walked into Shake Shack, oh, it's a whole Korean menu, right? So there are these trends that kind of come and go. Detroit style pizza is another one. We're <coughs> gonna start to see it everywhere. They're opening a place called Jets here in town. It's gonna be awesome, but it's still a bit of a food trend, I could say. This one is really important to me personally. Um, I wanna hear your interpretation, and somebody better say something, because I heard this was like Fairview High School, so give me something here. Um, be nice to people on the way up. You will see them again on the way down. This is a very common restaurant adage, as we said. How do you interpret that statement? I would say like it's like you're a dishwasher and like you're gonna rise up the ranks, but like you play as a dishwasher and be nice to all the other dishwashers. When you get up, you'll probably have a better relationship with them than the other managers might have, so you might get things done more quickly, or they might want to help you more than they would otherwise. Yes, if you show your team spirit from the beginning, like willing to help other people with things, I think it certainly helps you advance within any organization, any any business. Anyone else have a spin on this? You were talking about you know the restaurant industry and being fickle, right? And I think that's with anything in life though. If you treat people well on the way up when things are going good, they'll be there for you when things are going bad. Yes, thank you. That's that really distills it down for me. Yes, thank you. That's really the essence for me. Have you ever seen someone in oh sorry, one more tip? Right. 
fosters a good team environment. Because even if the pay is not awesome and the work is hard, at least you have the person on your left and right that you can like make jokes with and hang with, right? Be convivial, totally. So I want to come back to your definition or your interpretation only because this to me is also important because have you ever seen anyone in a restaurant setting or a bar setting or somewhere treat one of the people behind the counter or the server or the bartender with some disrespect? Have you ever seen someone disrespect somebody that's in a service position? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like you remember this clearly or like you've just seen it a lot? There's, there's been so many times like in restaurants where I'm like either with my family or just like kind of countless times where I could just overhear conversations of like how they're talking to the servers and like even when I was a kid I was like and I just remember feeling so bad like yeah. because it was late or they forgot something and I'd always just try to like smile or just like when they would come to our table next like it's just really common sometimes or like yeah I don't know so you noticed it from an early age you kind of felt this disrespectful tone and you're like yeah. it doesn't seem right yeah, it, it's, yeah it's kind of common unfortunately anybody else any specific memory of oh well like there's definitely a lot of like chefs and that I've met that can be really rude like even if they make the problem like they fuck no they mess things mess up, things up. Yeah. Um, and then you'd be like, oh, like, hey, like, they didn't want this, they wanted that, and then they get really mad at you, but you're like, you right. put it in the order right, so it's their fault. Got it. Are you talking in your current job setting? Yeah, only yeah. one of the chefs. Yeah, I know what you're saying. So there's the trade, and like, you're like, no, no, they didn't want breakfast, they want asparagus, and the chef's like, ah, or like, they're just upset, right? Yeah. But that could be they're having a bad day, and they have an unhappy home life, and their job sucks. Like, it could be a lot of things, right? But I guess my point is back to the customer service element. I really have to call people out on this a lot. So at the, I'm gonna tell you a very personal story. So this happened at the, um, I was worried about working at a frat because I was worried they were gonna be a bunch of entitled 19 to 21 year old kids. And well, they are, so I wasn't wrong. But they've been generally cordial and respectful. And then the last week of class in December, there was a finals, oh, they had finals, so everybody was stressed, right? Because they hadn't been studying all semester and all of a sudden they're trying to study in like 48 hours to pass the exam. And this kid was pretty stressed, so I had cheeseburgers. We had cheeseburgers that day, I put out, 35, which is the usual amount I put out. And some of the boys were more hungry than usual, so they grabbed two or three. Like, I could see they were kind of grabbing more than they should. They're only supposed to have one. And then this kid comes to me at the end of the, end of the lunch service, and he, well, first he walked back into my kitchen, which I, I, I really, like, that's a tough one for me. I really try to have, like, a line. I just don't like people coming back into the space because it's hot, it's dangerous, there's water on the floor. You know, like, I don't, I just don't want anything bad to happen. So he walked into my space. You can probably imagine this stuff. And he said, Chef, there's no cheeseburgers. I said, yeah, you know, like, that's all. Like, I literally had no more. Like, if I had had one more, I would have made it. But I was like, I just brought out. Like, I think some of you guys took two. And he's like, he goes, he thought for a minute, because I was pissed. He goes, make me a grilled cheese. And so, I don't know how you guys would handle that situation, but I was like, okay. And this is a 20-year-old kid. I'm 45. Like, you know, but I was just like, I kind of was like, okay. So I did. I made the grilled cheese. I brought it to him. And I said, look, you really shouldn't talk to people like that, especially when you're trying to get something from them. You know, like I just had that kind of like bubble moment. It's harder to do that with a customer in your restaurant because they might be like F you and read a bad Yelp review. But does that make sense? That kind of was a personal story that happened to me recently. It just kind of reminded me, you just have to be kind to people. And they don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's like ridiculous. Why would you insult the chef or try and... You know what I mean? That's truly in this case. So, yeah. I mean, so it's just that's kind of a microcosm of what, but what I'm, my point is that's a microcosm of what many people in our industry experience on a daily basis. Servers and bartenders especially, predominantly young women, have maybe have never had a position of power before or been in a powerful position. All the time, you know, I, my wife was a server and bartender for many years. Comments, inappropriate touching from customers, like it's just it's part of the, the game unless you work for an organization establishment that says this is not going to be part of the game. Okay, so that's just kind of a little bit of real talk about that. Yep. All right, Shane had a few questions for me. Let me see. All right, questions. Anybody have any questions right now? No? So I'm covering a lot in a short amount of time. All right, I'm, I want Chef to pick the two most interesting of these questions because you had a lot of them. And I don't want to make it out to seem like the whole industry is just break with terribleness, like it's not, but there's it's, there's some of it out there, and some business owners do a better job than others of, you know, controlling it and managing it with their employees and protecting their people. So, 
Seth, I thought you sent me. Okay, here it is. Why don't you pick your favorite one or two that you think is relevant? Well, to I can tell you right now. Wow. Yeah. What does one do to get a foot in the door in the food service industry? Yeah, show up on time, be willing to work. Don't exaggerate your experience, like don't make it up. Uh, but just be honest. So like if you help your mother or father at home with cooking, for example, you could say that. Like if you're just looking for a first job, you could be like, I, you know, I do a lot of cooking in the home. And that counts for some things. That shows at least you have some acumen. You like have some experience, you know how to cook. Um, and just be honest with people and just tell them what you're looking for. Um, and the customer service piece. I think that was a good reminder what you had said about even if you're the cook in the back and you never even see the customers, you still have to have good customer service skills you still have to deal with all the people around you in like a, in a dynamic way. So customer service skills, just being a professional, polished person, like, but with an emphasis on time. You wanna also be efficient. You can't just be like sitting there for like, you know, two hours peeling potatoes and thinking about your life. Like you gotta like move through things very quickly. So you do have to keep a certain pace in mind. Can you talk about any issues or any changes or the current status of um, diversity, both uh, with regards to race, religion, gender, um, yeah, in the industry. Yeah, I mean the best thing I can highlight on that is look up Google search James Beard Award winners, and James Beard Awards is like one of the highest uh, accolades that a restaurant or chef can get, a restaurant <coughs> can get, and for many years was dominated by Caucasian males in French and Italian restaurants. It was kind of like the thing, and if you look, if you type in James Beard Award winners from this past year, over fifty percent were from ethnic minorities, non-Caucasian. Over 50% were women in the field. Like, there's like a whole new crew of people, a lot of recent immigrants who brought the cuisine of their country to the United States, Senegal, Japan, China. People like really bring the intrinsic home culture to the US. Like, that's, that's really cool, because that's at the highest level of recognition. And so I think there is a trickle down too. Can you give us, um, in, I'll make it a challenge, in uh, maybe 20 small phrases from walking in the door to going home at night? What happens in a typical restaurant? 20 or 15 quick things starting off with walk okay. in the door. Yeah, so I brought, actually I brought a couple of props. So this is like a, a, you can pass this around, it's a clean apron. This is the kind of apron you typically get. It's a crappy apron, they'll usually give you a crappy one. That's like a $4 apron or something, almost disposable. So you're gonna wear that, it's gonna protect you from both water if you're doing dishes, it's also gonna protect you from getting your whites. Uh, you know, typically people wear whites, you don't wanna get food splatter on there. But this is an apron I've had for 20 years, so I've just kind of carried it from every kitchen that I've been. I like this apron because a couple reasons. One, it protects me generally here. It's very lightweight, it's breathable. It's not like super suffocating. And vertical stripes, does anyone know what vertical stripes? What does it make you look? Taller. Taller, yeah, it makes you look taller. Yeah. And for some reason, people like, respect people that are tall. It's weird, it's a weird world. But you know, you feel a little bit tall and you stand a little more upright. Uh, horizontal stripes make you look wider, another option. So, um, and then I want to talk a little about the uniform. So, this is how I'm going to work. I'm literally going to the front right after this. So um, there's something that's interesting about Chef. Typically the outfit you're gonna have, or the uniform you're gonna have two rows of buttons. You can choose which way to button. I have a shirt underneath. But one of the things people don't know often is, like you know a chef might be working busy in the restaurant and then they have to go talk to a customer. Part of the reason it's designed like this, let's say you had a dirty lapel and some oil and splatter, then you just switch it up, and you just go the other way, and then you can walk out and you look neat. And your appearance, right? So that's probably why the two rows of buttons. Um, the pants are lightweight. They're, again, breathable is important because most kitchens are 80 to 100 degrees depending on the day and the weather and the season. Um, so you're gonna be super hot, so you want breathable clothes. They're somewhat fire retardant. Like, they don't catch fire easily. They're not frayed. Um, so that's important when you're choosing like a pant. Just something loose fitting that's comfortable. You don't wanna wear jeans. If you wear jeans in like a kitchen, you're like, you're just gonna like suffer. It's gonna be terrible. Um, you wear a hat, I mean, most places let you decide what kind of hat you want to wear. There's chef hats, there's tall chef hats, there's little chef hats, there's all kinds. Most places just say wear a hat, because the health, the health department says you have to wear a hat. So, um, shoes, another fun one, so a lot of um, nurses wear clogs and a lot of chefs wear clogs. And the reason why in the kitchen we often wear clogs, A, there's no um, holes in here. There's no way for hot oil or liquid, hot soup or anything to get into the shoe. So you don't really want to wear, what are the ones called with the holes? Uh, Crocs. So Crocs are cool for like leisure wear. You don't want to wear them in the kitchen because anything hot would immediately just, just like fry your foot. 
So the other nice thing about clogs, A, you don't need to button them, or sorry, you don't need to lace them. B, they generally have like a very non-stick sole that you can even walk on slight bits of oil and water and you just grip, it's a very grippy sole. And then two, if I were to have a total disaster and clumsy chef Shane like pour some hot oil in my direction, you can quickly escape and like just get out of the situation if you did get hot oil down into your shoe. So. Things like that do happen fairly frequently. Um, things fall to the floor that are red hot and hit your shoes and your legs. And yeah, it happens, especially the hot oil of a fryer. It's one of the most dangerous parts. Um, but then I think it's just respect. So whoever I report to, let's say it's chef, I'd go up to them as soon as I'm ready for work, which is like on time or early, right? Hey, what do you need? What can I set up? Yeah, and you're gonna get a quick, a quick first, second, third things. Or maybe a list, there might be a maybe, list. Hopefully a list. Or maybe like, here, I need all this in the next three hours or whatever. So some time-based element. Uh, or it might be more like, I need to start with this and then do this and then come talk to me after. <laughs> That's a common one too. Um, and then just like, you just work. You're on your feet all day. You can take short breaks in the alley or in the back. There's not usually a break room or any kind of like nice fancy place to take a break to just sit on a milk crate in the alley. Um, do you really get breaks? I give myself breaks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the old adage in that restaurant industry is everyone smoked cigarettes back when I started because if you smoke cigarettes, that was the only way to get a break. You'd be like, oh, I gotta go smoke a cigarette. I need a five minute break. So then they would peace out. And if you didn't smoke cigarettes, you couldn't get a break. So it was kind of unfair. Now, not that many people smoke cigarettes anymore. People smoke other things, of course, but um, you have to kind of carve out opportunities to take a break, and it's not always in a dignified environment. So. Is there um, drugs and alcohol? Um, as we're down to the last two minutes, yeah, yeah. What, what about substance abuse in the yeah. industry? And is there any support for people who have substance abuse? Yeah, thank you for that, Shane. That's, that's something else very important to me. So, you know, I've worked in this field for 20 plus years. I've had a lot of friends succumb to suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse, divorce, messed up relationships. I've had a lot of friends have a lot of issues. And uh, I've actually joined, I volunteer with an organization out of Arvada called CHOW, which is specifically for mental health to support people in our industry. Because you just have ready access to a lot of drugs and alcohol when you're in the, in the food world. At the end of the night, a lot of times at a bar, everyone on staff will do a shot at midnight. It's kind of a tradition, everyone goes and does a quick shot at midnight. There's like an active drinking culture that's kind of encouraged. And not just on Friday and Saturday nights, but every night. Like there's this kind of feeling like you just wanna, and it's partly out of good things like team bonding, like let's all hang out and drink and have a good night, like let's have fun after work. But then what it ends up being is you get home at three in the morning feeling terrible and then you wake up and do it again. And I do think there's a little bit of an adrenaline piece to that. I think that when you work a busy night in a restaurant, you get adrenaline, your body's a little bit hyped. So it's hard to go home at 11 o'clock and just sit down on your pillow and go to bed. So I think there's a little bit of a kind of lifestyle piece there, but I do think Drugs and alcohol is still plaguing our industry a lot. And um, our industry also, I'll lastly say, attracts a lot of neurodiverse individuals, as you could say. I have so many chefs I've worked with over the years and cooks, ADHD, dyslexia, um, numerous other challenges, OCD, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression. Like most of the people I've worked with have had something going on, as they say. And so I think it's an interesting field. I think um, if you're drawn to it, I think just go get a job. As, as some of you have done. It, it'll, it'll be your test, right? If you spend six months working somewhere that's professional and busy, you're gonna know, like, this is for me or this is not for me. So I really think that. As we're winding down time, let's uh, end this with a little bit of an interesting levity. What's the worst thing you've ever dropped or the biggest, worst mistake you've ever made? Oh yeah, no, no question. So I worked in an Italian restaurant in Chicago called Fortunato, and every I had to make all the sauces for the pasta station. I was the pasta guy, so I had to do all the pasta, all the sauces. And I had a giant, giant batch of, uh, what was it called? It was like a tomato-based sauce with capers, um, not full of time. Arrabbiata. Arrabbiata? Arrabbiata. Anyway, so like a big, giant jug, and it's right before service. We're about to get rolling, and I walk over to the walk-in, and I just take like one missed stumble as I go over the bridge of the walk-in, like the little thing, and just the whole thing, and the whole pool is just like fills with just like red, just like, and I just like stood there for a while. But again, my team, I was like, hey guys, uh, can you come look at this? And everyone came in, everyone, you know, grabs a mop and grabs some towels and just like figures it out in like five minutes. It would take me an hour, you know? Wow. So, and I felt crappy, but everyone was coming. <laughs> well, um, yeah, there are adventures to be had in the food service industry and- uh, Yeah, I don't want to scare you away from it. It's super fun. Like, I still love what I do. And then back to the quote that I had written up there, I still love every part of it. Well, maybe not every part, but like, I love what I do because it involves food and people. And for me, there's no greater satisfaction than 
showing hospitality towards other people, making them feel comfortable in your own home or your own restaurant, and just like being a part of that experience for people. Great. Well, let, you guys, uh, let's hear it. And thank you for Chef Stephen uh, Maynard. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.